Since I started making games, I've always been fascinated by procedural generation and how we can design systems that in turn can build worlds. I also never was much of an artist besides some drawings when I was a kid, and have always been kind of discouraged by the amount of work the art part of a game project holds, especially level design. So when I eventually got serious about game dev and decided to start an indie project that I was going to ship no matter what, I had to take my weaknesses into consideration and design around my strengths. I knew I wanted to make a third person game with real time fluid gameplay. I knew I wanted to tell a story and I knew I wanted this project to be achievable in a reasonable time frame and not be the project that one drags for a decade. That's when the idea to make a third person roguelite came in. I have always been fascinated by roguelikes and roguelites from a technical perspective and have always found that there weren't enough 3D roguelites with compelling third person gameplay and combat. So I decided to make one and what better project to make than the one you have been eager to play. I spent about a year prototyping, building and exploring the Unrealverse for what technologies, plugins and samples I could use to give me a head start and put me on the right track. And the right track I found in the form of Epic's Action RPG sample, the Dungeon Architect plugin and a multitude of asset and animations from our beloved marketplace. I detailed the process of building this base framework in my previous devlog, where I explained how I combined all these resources to achieve a vertical slice of my vision for the game, with enjoyable characters, fluid movement in combat, compelling weapons and skills, interesting and frustrating enemies, and most importantly, procedural dungeons. And in this new devlog, we will dive deeper into procedural generation, explore the different ways I experimented with, detail how I decided to build my procedural dungeons, as well as my process for doing so. So let's start with the design. My game, Warden's Will, is a medieval fantasy third-person roguelite, where you have to destroy a dark force that plagues the depths of Earth. To do so, you have to go through a procedural dungeon and find your way to the dark force, and also find a way to destroy it once and for all. In every procedural dungeon that is generated, there are different paths a Warden can walk to get to the final boss, and there are also alternate paths that lead elsewhere. Paths consist of different rooms that have different gameplays each. Some rooms are fighting rooms where you will fight your way through hordes of creatures that the Dark Force sends your way, or fight bosses that will give you the necessary knowledge for your quest. Others will require you to solve some puzzles in order to advance. And some other rooms will have some more exotic gameplay, like treasures, player upgrades, and even procedural story elements. Finishing a dungeon will require consistent gameplay as well as knowledge of the game systems, and finishing the game will require even deeper knowledge of the dungeons, and a specific sequence of actions you have to undertake in order to uncover the full story and destroy the force for good. Telling a story in a procedural game is not an easy task, and while I will not get into much detail about this in this video, I am planning on telling a small story in my game, the story of this force and how it came to be, and why it plagues the earth the way it does. Procedural storytelling is a very interesting subject, and I hope I will have enough time to explore it for this project and also make some videos about it. So don't forget to subscribe if that is of interest to you. And to all those of you who are already subscribed, I would like to show you my gratitude. We are now more than a thousand. The community we are building is so constructive and I have really been astonished by the high level and quality of the comment section. So thank you so much guys. You are the ones giving me the strength to stay on mission. This community is turning out much better than my prevision. And together we will build and reach what we envision. And speaking of vision, in order to achieve my vision for the procedural dungeons, I chose to use the Dungeon Architect plugin. It is a plugin that is available for both Unreal and Unity, offers a lot of features, is very well documented, and has been around now for quite some time with consistent updates and with the creator being very responsive and available. Dungeon Architect has what is called builders. Builders are essentially the types of dungeons you can generate with it. I will only detail some of them in this video, but for those who are interested in the others I will be putting a link to the official website in the description. Some of these builders also offer what is called flow graphs, and these are graphs that define the flow of your dungeon. Everything that we spoke about previously, having different paths, different room gameplays, bosses, treasures, keys and locked doors, etc. can be configured using these flow graphs. There are two builders that offer flow graph support in Dungeon Architect, and those are the ones that interest us, the Grid Flow Builder and the newly available Snap Grid Flow Builder. The first one, the Grid Flow Builder, is a tile-based generation builder. It is what I have been using until now and what you have seen in my previous videos. It uses a theme file where you need to configure all the tiles that your dungeon requires. Walls, ground floors, fences, ceilings, doors, etc. And it will then use these tiles to generate a dungeon that fits the flow graph you defined. 
It is a very practical builder for small dungeons and it generates great looking level layouts. The downside is that it is quite hard to properly decorate and light your dungeon at runtime because of the tile based nature of the builder and the other downside is that it does not offer level streaming. So once you generate your dungeon, it will all be in a single level and will be loaded entirely by the engine, which is not suited for games that require large dungeons. The second one, the Snap Grid Flow Builder, is a bit different. Instead of being tile based, this one is level based. So basically, instead of defining the different tiles that your dungeon will use to build its rooms, you actually design the rooms themselves that will constitute your dungeons. This requires much more time to work with since you have to design the different levels of rooms yourself and it ultimately generates less interesting layouts because the rooms have static sizes and offers less variety than what can be generated by a tile based generation. The upsides of this builder though come in the form of control. Control over your levels and their level design, control over your room lighting and decorations, and control over level streaming. Since we are using individual levels, it is easier to use level streaming and have only the rooms that are visible to the player be loaded at a given moment. This allows us to have beautifully decorated and lit rooms with much more assets, since we will never have more than two or three of them loaded at once. The room where the player is and the adjacent rooms. After some experimentation with the Snap Grid Flow Builder, I decided it was the right one for my project. It offers the level of control I need to have good looking rooms, allows for some custom gameplay in those rooms, and is usable with level streaming, which is going to be necessary if I want to ship my game on mobile platform, which is what I plan to do after the initial release of the game on PC, Mac, and Linux. So I started creating a new dungeon with this builder. The first thing to do when you want to create a Snap Grid Flow dungeon is to create a module bounds asset. This asset, as its name suggests, defines the bound of your rooms and also its connections. More of the connections a bit later. It is basically an invisible cube with a specific size that you define and that is going to be the unit size of your rooms. Every room will have to be a multiple of this size. Once we have our module bounds asset ready, we can start creating a room, or as the Snap Grid Flow Builder calls them, a module. To do that, we create an empty level and add the module bounds actor to it. We can then see the bounds that the room should not exceed in red and we can set the size and the properties of the module bounds actor in our level. This actor also displays where the connections of our rooms are going to be. These are displayed in blue and that is where our doors are going to be if this room is connected to another one via that side or else it is going to be a wall. Connections are basically defined using a special dungeon architect asset where you can specify doors, walls, locked doors, one-way doors, etc. These connections are placed in the levels and the proper assets are spawned depending on the configuration of the room. A room does not have to have connections on all sides and different levels can have different connections. So these assets can also be used to bring more variety to the dungeon. Once we have a room ready that respects the level bounds and has connections placed correctly, we can set up the rest of the system. Before that, we create a dungeon theme file and leave it empty. We will get back to it later. The next thing to do is to create a module database. This is an asset that will reference our module bounds asset and all our module levels. We can give them names or IDs and usage probability that defines how much this module should be used compared to others. With the module database created, we can move on to the flow graph setup. This is the asset that defines the flow of our dungeon and how it is going to be built and played. It defines the paths of our dungeon, where the locked doors will be, if there's a treasure room, where the start and end rooms will be, and is also where we can configure the spawn of certain items like loot, chests, or even enemies if we want. We start by creating a flow graph asset and set our module database in its properties. Then we can start generating a dungeon. We start by just creating a main path of a specific number of rooms to test our configuration in our first room. And after some trial and error, some adjustment of the level bounds and the connections, we have a procedural dungeon. And a not so bad looking one. It only has one room, but already has some variety with the connections, and the level streaming is working just fine. We now need to create more rooms. I started by creating a boss room, a room we will find at the end of one of the dungeon's paths. I recycled the room from my pre-built levels and adapted it to fit inside my module bounds. Here are some tips when working with maps and levels in Unreal Engine. The first step when working with levels, the easy way to copy, past and move entire parts of a level is to use the top or side views. They allow you to select all assets easily and you can then copy all of them to another level. The second tip is when you're pasting assets from one level to the other, create a folder in the world outliner of your destination level and paste your asset under it by having it selected when you hit Ctrl V or Command V to paste it. 
This way, if you do not place it correctly the first time, you can just select all descendant assets of that folder and move them again without selecting anything that was already in your level. And the third tip is actually when you want to switch views in the Unreal viewport, you can hold control and click and drag the middle mouse button to the direction of the view you want. Drag from bottom to top for the top view, from left to right for the right view, and also drag diagonally from the top right to the bottom left to get back to the 3D perspective view. You can also click and drag middle mouse button when in a top or side view to measure your level without holding control. So I spent some time creating some modules and setting them up correctly with the bounds and connections. I created a lift module that spans two vertical units and allows the dungeon to have two floors. I created a spawn room where the player begins at the start of the dungeon. And I also created a small room to just add some variety to the dungeon paths. Once we have some module variety in our module database and a well configured flow graph, it is time now to move on to actor placement in our level. If our module or level will have some actors spawned in it, for example a chest, a key or even an enemy, we need to specify what those actors are and where they can be placed to avoid spawning them in unreachable locations. To do that we use what is called placeable markers and the theme file we created before left empty. In our flow graph we add the spawn items node to spawn a specific item and we configure its properties. Which path should it be spawned in, how many of them should we spawn, the probability of the spawn and we give it a marker name. We then create a placeable marker asset. We configure it with the right marker name and place it in our levels where we want the actor's items to spawn. Now we have to add it to the theme file. So we open our theme file and we first start by changing the dungeon builder type of our theme to snap grid flow in our properties, which will remove all existing markers that aren't useful for our dungeon type. And we can start adding our own markers. The first one we will add is the enemy marker. This marker will be placed where enemies are going to spawn. We then specify our different enemy actors and give them some probability to have a variety of them spawn. Our flow graph will spawn enemies, which will be placed where our enemy placeable markers are in the levels, and which will be one of the enemy actors defined in our theme file. With that done, we move on to the player start marker. The player start marker works the same, except it doesn't require a spawn items node in the flow graph. We can set the marker name directly in the create main path node. So we create our placeable marker, configure its name to correspond to the marker name in the flow graph, add it to the theme file and specify the player start actor, place it in our spawn room that we created before and that's it. We now have a dungeon with a spawn room, different paths, a boss room and enemies that spawn along the way with increasing difficulty. Our dungeon is ready to be tested. To play test, we have to configure our game mode and persistent level to generate the dungeon when we start to play. To do that, we set our level blueprint to build the dungeon on begin play and override the can start match function of our game mode to only allow the game to start when the dungeon is ready and when our boolean flag is set to true. We hook the event that notifies when the dungeon is ready and when the spawn room is loaded to change the boolean flag in our game mode so that the game can start. With this done, our dungeon is ready to be played. We hit the play button and a new dungeon will be built following our flow graph with the rooms defined in our module database, actors will be spawned in their right placement and once the dungeon is ready and the spawn room is loaded, the player character is teleported to the player start and the game begins. I am quite satisfied with this system and really like the balance between modularity and control that it offers. So my decision to use it for my project is confirmed and I can now start building upon it. There are still many things to do to have a fun and enjoyable dungeon that will offer enough replayability. I need a lot more rooms, which I know how to do by now, but moreover I need those rooms to be decorated randomly and that's something I didn't try yet. So let's give it a try to de-risk it and be confident about it further down the road. To decorate my rooms I will use a free plugin made by the same creator of Dungeon Architect called Prefabricator. This plugin basically offers prefab support for Unreal Engine. It's only available for Unreal since Unity already has prefabs built in. Prefabs are basically sets of assets that can be grouped together and placed together in a level as one asset. Prefabs can also be nested inside other prefabs and the most important feature is that multiple prefabs can be grouped as a prefab collection which then can be placed in a level and randomized to spawn one of the prefabs it holds. To do that we start by creating some basic prefabs for rocks, rubbles, sand, vegetation, etc. We create a prefab collection and reference all our prefabs in it. We then can place as many instances as we want in our level and randomize them to have different assets. 
In order to have these prefab collections be randomized at runtime when we start the game, we add a prefab randomizer actor to our level and tick the randomize on begin play checkbox in the properties. With that done, we hit play and there you go. Our dungeon rooms are now decorated randomly and start to look different from one another. There is still some more advanced usage of the prefabricator plugin, which allows a level to have multiple prefab collections randomized but synced together, and we will use that in the future to randomize things like fences, statues, pillars, etc. There are also other ways to differentiate the rooms. Connections are also very useful for that and will be used to differentiate rooms and room types in general. But the most important way to differentiate rooms is going to be gameplay, and that will be the subject of a future devlog. We will be building a modular gameplay system that will specify the gameplay of the rooms. Some rooms will be combat rooms and will require the player to survive against enemy waves or bosses. Some other rooms will require the player to solve puzzles to be able to advance. And some others will offer gameplay challenges and some exotic gameplay. In addition to room gameplay systems, we will also have room elements, which are actors that players can interact with, like secret areas, treasure chests, traps, and even armories where the player can alter the character build. I hope that with all this variety and modularity the dungeons will feel fresh every time the player plays the game until he or she acquires the necessary knowledge to complete the dungeon the right way and beat the dark force for good. So in the next dev vlog we will be exploring the gameplay systems and gameplay elements to breathe some life into this now good looking but still life lacking dungeons. And that's it for me guys for this devlog, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned some things along the way. If that's the case, please hit that like button, it helps the channel a lot. And if you're not yet subscribed, please consider subscribing if you are interested in game dev and game design. I know many of you are still waiting for the gameplay ability system video and I promise you it is the next video coming up on this channel, so stay tuned. And as usual, my name is Anis, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.